And now look to Salma Kami Ayub to continue the case for the proposition. Hear, hear. Hey, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, first of all, I want to apologize for my slightly unorthodox entrance. I was sitting outside quietly because I'm in the middle of a pretty horrible flu. So please bear with me. I hope that um, it doesn't detract from what I'm going to say. It also means, unfortunately, I wasn't able to hear everything that was said before me. Um, so I may not be able to respond directly to those points. But I hope that in what I do say, I will cover the issue as comprehensively as I can in this short time. So what, um, what I want to suggest to you is that there are really three uh, main reasons that the two-state solution is unattainable. The first is that Israel's settlement enterprise in the West Bank precludes the emergence of a viable Palestinian state. The second is that even if um, the settlements could be dismantled, Israel has no intention of doing that. And thirdly, that the international community will not force Israel to withdraw from the West Bank so as to allow for the realization of a two-state solution. So let's start with point number one. I think the starting point for this debate has to be essentially the map, the current map of Israel-Palestine. So I think it's clear that Israel's settlement enterprise in the West Bank, which covers the length and the breadth of the territory, that fragments the Palestinian territory into many tiny pieces, clearly prevents territorial contiguity required for the emergence of a viable state. So in other words, as things stand now, there is no possibility for a two-state solution unless something were to radically change. And that takes me on to the second point, which is that even if it were possible to dismantle the settlements, the fact is that Israel has no intention of doing that and never has had any intention of doing that. And that is very clearly evidenced, in my view, by the fact that every single Israeli government since time immemorial, which for these purposes is since the beginning of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, has relentlessly built settlements in the West Bank. So in other words, what that means is that every Israeli government has, a pre has pursued a policy of creating facts on the ground that frustrate the outcome of a two-state solution. And I really don't think you need any clearer evidence of intentions than that, because it's, it's the actions of a government that count, right? Not the spin, not the propaganda. And uh, the consistency of action as well between Israeli governments in terms of, of building settlements, in my view, stems from a fundamental uh, Israeli ideology, an ideology that underlines the state which is uh, expansionist in nature, which is uh, preoccupied with securing Israeli dominance, and um, which fundamentally doesn't believe that the Palestinians are really entitled to a state in the West Bank and Gaza. I think that's, that's the bottom line. No thanks. So this may be framed as an ideological issue, that the West Bank, or as Israelis would call it, Judea and Samaria are an integral part of Israel. Sometimes it's also uh, framed as a security issue, you know, that a, a sovereign, viable Palestinian state is too great of a security threat for Israel to tolerate. But the result is always the same, and that's greater and greater entrenchment of the Israeli settlement enterprise. And so I want to be clear, this isn't just a problem of the Israeli rights, as it's sometimes uh, presented. And um, that's not to say that this current government in Israel is anything but uh, honest about the fact that it's opposed to a two-state solution. I mean, we know that Netanyahu has said there'll be no Palestinian state. We know that there are at least 16 government ministers on record as being openly opposed to any form of two-state solution. But the point is that it goes further than that. It's a problem also of the so-called left. Okay, so I want to give an example. Um, Yitzhak Rabin's government Remember, this was in the 1990s. Yitzhak Rabin was hailed as a great peacemaker. He was a signer of the Oslo Accords. And he actually accelerated settlement expansion during his term in office. So that the settler population tripled 
uh, in the West Bank and Gaza during the 1990s. I think that's completely, uh, you know, outstanding. That is extraordinary, right? That during a time when everything was meant to be stopped in order for a state, a Palestinian state to emerge, settlement expansion actually increases. No thanks. In 1995 alone, the Rabin government spent $600 million on building settlement bypass roads in the West Bank. Okay, these are the roads that connect the settlements with Israel proper, and they have a big role in fragmenting the Palestinian territory. Now, you just don't spend those sums of money on an infrastructure that you intend to be temporary. So that's the point here. No Israeli government wants or has ever wanted genuinely to implement the two-state solution, no thanks. And this is demonstrated clearly in, in their actions. I'd like to say a brief word as well about the negotiations. Um, there's a kind of narrative that you hear time and time again that it's just a question of finding the right negotiators, it's just a question of finding, getting the right leaders around the table, uh, and a deal can somehow be struck between Israel and the Palestinians. And I think that's, that's a total red herring. We have to be clear that Israel hasn't made a single serious offer to the Palestinians during negotiations that the Palestinians could reasonably be expected to agree to. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean is if you look at the, the requirements that Israel has said it, it needs for this future Palestinian state to emerge, they fall far short of what is required for there to be a sovereign and viable and contiguous Palestinian state in the West Bank. So that's even if we take Israel's so-called maximum offers, its most generous offers, what you get is something that falls far short of a two-state solution. Um, I'll give you some examples. So Israel wants to keep the settlement blocks, and I think one of the previous speakers mentioned this, and this is often hailed as a kind of reason. It's presented by the other side as a way to salvage a two-state solution. It's said these settlement blocks are where most of the settlers live, and as if, if Israel keeps them in a future deal, then most of the settlers won't have to be evacuated. But actually, Israel keeping the settlement blocks is massively disruptive to a future Palestinian state. Okay, these settlement blocks encircle East Jerusalem, cutting it off from the West Bank. They extend deep into the Palestinian uh, territory, disrupting contiguity. They sit on Palestine's main water aquifers, controlling the future state's water resources. Then there are other things that Israel has said it wants. It wants to control the Jordan Valley to the east. It wants strips of Israeli sovereignty extending from the settlement blocks to the Jordan Valley that would break up the territory in two or three pieces. It wants the Palestinian state to be demilitarized to the extent that the state wouldn't even have self-defense capabilities. And that's a must for every, any sovereign state needs to at least be able to defend itself from attack. And it wants to control Palestinian land borders, territorial waters, and airspace. Okay, seriously, this is, this is supposedly the really generous offer. These are all the, the maximum concessions. Uh, and I think it's, it's clear, therefore, from the negotiations process, you're not going to end up with a two-state solution, however much the Palestinians bend over backwards and do things like give up the right of return and give up any meaningful notion of East Jerusalem being their capital. You don't, you don't get a two-state solution through the negotiations. N now, you may think Israeli demands are reasonable. These security demands for a, a military presence in the West Bank and all are, are reasonable. Uh, and I won't argue with you on that. I mean, I don't agree that they're reasonable. But let's just say they are reasonable. You, the point is, what you don't get if you take that approach it are two viable, sovereign, contiguous pal states side by side. So you don't get a two-state solution through negotiations. Um, and finally, because my time's up, it's a very uh, brief point. It's just to say that if you take away Israel's intention to produce a two-state solution, and you bear in mind that the Palestinians are too weak to obtain their independence through military means, um, I think the only other option for producing a two-state solution would be for the international community to force Israel to withdraw from the West Bank. Uh, and the, the short story is that that's not going to happen. Um, by the international community, I mean the Western states, who are powerful enough 
to impose action, to impose a, an outcome on Israel. For years, they've supported Israel. Um, they've funded it and uh, to the hilt and have applied no meaningful pressure on Israel to withdraw uh, from the West Bank. And there's no indication or evidence whatsoever that that's going to change. So I think whichever way you look at this, um, the two-state solution is unattainable. And just the very last point I'd like to make is to say that I don't necessarily come here to say that gleefully, the two-state solution is unattainable. You might think that it's because I have some agenda I want to promote a different solution. Not necessarily. It may be that other solutions, like the one-state solution or the confederated solution, are similarly unattainable. It's just that we have to be realistic. We have to look at what's actually going on. We have to look at the record of Israeli actions. And we have to come to a reasonable assessment based on facts. And I think if you do that, you, you will inevitably come to the same conclusion that I have done, which is the two-state solution is unattainable. Thank you.